In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed. Christ is risen. 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 Christ is Today we celebrate the Feast of Mid-Pentecost. I guess I don't need to explain to you why I call it the Forgotten Feast in the <laughs> Paschal Cycle. You'll uh, understand that, I think, immediately. And there is a, a sadness in that. Perhaps it's the name of the feast that, that doesn't transmit to people somehow all of its power and beauty mid-Pentecost, so the average Canadian Orthodox hears, well, the Church likes to mark off time and has found the midpoint between Pascha and Pentecost and called it a day and made it a feast. Well, it is a midpoint, but of course the Church would not be interested in simply telling people what the midpoint is between two feasts. The Gospel tells us more, much more, and then we really begin to understand why the Church stops us at this point. The Gospel tells us that at the middle of the feast, it was another feast, and we will see immediately which feast on the Hebrew liturgical calendar it was, that at the middle of the feast, the Lord went up to the temple to teach. So on the Hebrew liturgical calendar, there are three great feasts. Yes, the Jews have a liturgical calendar, of course they do. It is the reason, by the way, why we have a liturgical calendar as well, and we actually have some common feasts that have different meanings. The Jews have the Feast of Pentecost, we have the Feast of Pentecost. It surprises people to hear this. But these, there are three great feasts on the Hebrew <coughs> liturgical calendar. One, of course, everyone knows, Pascha, which is divided into three sub-feasts. Then there is Pentecost, the Feast of the Harvest, of the Ingathering. And then there is a third feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that feast, like the first feast, is also divided into three sub-feasts. Isn't that interesting? There are three great feasts, three, which are subdivided into seven. Three feasts become seven feasts. And you can see already something happening. The third feast, the Feast of Tabernacle, has, Tabernacles, has a midpoint because it is stretched over three different sub-feasts. And the Lord goes to, to up to the temple to teach at the midpoint, and therefore we have the middle of the feast. So what do the Jews do on the Feast of Tabernacles? They still do it in some places. They leave their homes and they live in little, I guess we could call them kind of lean-tos or huts outside of their homes. And towards the end of the feast is the time on the liturgical calendar when the expectation of the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah is at its liturgical apex. So, this is important to know. The Lord intentionally goes up at the middle so that he arrives to teach before the end. He is going to be there, present, at the end. And he goes to teach at the middle of the feast. This is very important because the Lord, of course, is for us the fulfillment of that feast, of the Feast of Tabernacles. We know him 
to be the Messiah promised to Israel. We also know him to be true God and true man. So at the middle of the feast, he goes up to teach. And those listening to him in the temple, including the people I call the religious professionals, are amazed to hear him. They say, how can he possibly speak like this when he has not been schooled? The Jews had schooling, of course, rabbinical type schooling for their people. St. Paul was very well schooled. The Lord they knew to have not been schooled. And so they were shocked when they heard him speak. And some of them, upon hearing him speak, as you could hear from the Gospel, from St. John's Gospel, came to the conclusion that he was the Messiah. And what a beautiful time on the liturgical calendar to come to that conclusion, when the Lord, when the Jews, rather, were expecting the coming of the Messiah. So, when we put ourselves back into the Old Testament and the New Testament, we begin to understand why this is so important. We will hear the rest on the Feast of Pentecost. But here already, the Church is giving us more than a hint. At the middle, at the middle of the feast, O Savior, fill my thirsting soul with the waters of godliness. What waters? Why is the Church talking about waters now? And what does all of this have to do with the Feast of Tabernacles? And why, in addition to that, will we in the Orthodox Church keep singing this troparion for another week? So in other words, this Sunday coming, people are going to hear something extra they didn't hear last weekend. They're going to hear this troparion of the mid-feast. They may not know that it is the troparion of the mid-feast, but they are going to hear it. And in, and in monasteries, you will hear that in all of the services for the next week, they're singing this in the middle of the feast, in the middle of the feast, constantly singing it. It becomes a big thing. It, you end up celebrating the mid-feast for a whole week. So, what water, in fact, are we talking about? Well, we look forward to the Gospel of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the Lord says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So already, this feast is designed to lovingly and gently take the Orthodox people and redirect them liturgically and spiritually without losing the feast of Pascha, while remaining the Feast of Pascha, adding onto it a second layer, and that is the layer of Pentecost, turning towards the, the day when that Gospel will be read. How is that? How does that connect? Again, with the Hebrew liturgical cycle. On the great day of the Feast, which came, which came at the end of the Tabernacles cycle, the priests would carry water through the city of Jerusalem, a lot of water carried in substantial containers. They would go to the base of the altar and they would pour the water into the base mixed with red wine. And that water that was poured and mixed with red wine poured in the base of the altar, was carried away from it with, with a plumbing system, to use modern language. It, if I remember correctly, drained into the Kidron Valley. So for anyone who begins to look at it, you begin to understand how profound the connection is. Here the priests are carrying water and the people who come to celebrate the Feast of, the Jews who come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and it was normative for all men to go, by the way, to celebrate the feast. And that's why they traveled from 
of, of regions where the Jews lived to be there for the Feast of Tabernacles. If not for the beginning, then at least for the mid part and the end. Would see the priests fully vested and bearded, carrying large containers of water through the city. And the Lord is going to say, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The Jews are going to understand. For, unfortunately for us who have lost, sadly, the knowledge of the Hebrew liturgical cycle on which our liturgical cycle is based, the connection is not immediately apparent. But when the connection is made, it's deeply moving because the water, of course, is the Holy Spirit. And we understand that during these 50 days, during these 50 days when we are not kneeling, when we are standing, when we are rejoicing, when we are celebrating Pascha for 40 full days, when we are celebrating still for another 10 days in between, between Ascension and Pascha, and still not kneeling for another 10, for a total of 50. And of course, there is a midpoint in the 50. When we are doing this, we are doing two things spiritually. And this is so important to remember, and here is pastorally where we see the loss, where the people don't grasp, where the people who, who come sell them to church and bring their baskets to be blessed and take their baskets home and go home for the rest of the year and miss these 50 days, miss the center of the Christian life, which is simply this, simply but profoundly this, that the Lord was crucified for us, died for our sins, and that when he died, water and blood came out of his side. And here we have the water and the wine being poured into the base of the altar, embodying the Lord's crucifixion, his death for us. The Lord who died for us and through whose, whose death we receive forgiveness of our sins was raised from the dead on the third day. And we celebrate Holy Pascha and for 40 or arguably 50 days, we turn towards the Lord who died for us and not only ask forgiveness of our sins, which I hope we do every day of the year, but we ask him for his new life. We ask for the grace to enter the resurrection, to be resurrected together with him, the one who died for us. At the same time, Having done this for half of the period and having reached the midpoint, the mid-feast, if the Jews have a mid-feast, we also have a mid-feast liturgically. Now the church is saying, for all of you who have celebrated the Lord's death and received forgiveness of sins, for all of you who have entered into the resurrection of the life, resurrection life, now it is also time for you to thirst for the Holy Spirit, thirst for the Holy Spirit, to know that you are thirsty. So many people in the world don't know they're thirsty or they don't know for what or for whom they are thirsty. We see this in our own society, a kind of an undefined thirst that shows itself, that drives people to go to the wrong places when they are thirsty and not go to Christ. For us, the church is saying, let that thirst develop now while keeping the new life of the resurrection, thirst for the Holy Spirit. And that is why we are singing right now and for the next week about the waters of godliness and about drinking them. You don't drink if you're not thirsty. And the church, in the church, Pentecost is a very, very great feast. 
So the wise people who assembled the liturgical calendar decided we had better get people ready for it. And they get people, they get all of us ready for it halfway through the period so that we spend the next half of the liturgical period thirsting for the Holy Spirit so that on the day when we sing for the first time in 50 days, O Heavenly King, it's not about that the church bans O Heavenly King for 50, 50 days as if it were a kind of a punishment or we're not allowed to sing heavenly king for 50 days you're not singing oh heavenly king for 50 days you're singing christ is risen for 40 days and the troparion for the ascension for another 10 so that you can develop your own personal thirst for the holy spirit and on the day of pentecost receive him again and just in case people didn't know it it isn't enough just to show up not having done anything for 50 days, not having thought about it, not having repented, not having prayed, not having received the Eucharist, not having done any of these things, and then we're going to receive the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. And it's not because the Holy Spirit is not given, but because human hearts are not prepared to receive Him. And so now we understand the meaning, and I hate to use this word, and the utility of a of a mid feast, why it's useful, why it's important, why we would want to have something to do with it, and maybe even why we might want to be in church on that day, and that if we are not in church on that day, that we do what the church is asking us to do, which only increases our joy so that we begin the 50 days in joy, in joy and end the 50 days in joy. This is a simple, basic explanation of why the church has a mid-feast and why we try to celebrate it in our own way.